Now let us bow our heads in meditation and prayer. Thou master mind of the universe, please let the spirit of understanding descend upon us that are gathered here in the inner circle tonight. We are each in his own way seekers after truth. Please let thy spirit of understanding guide us and bring the light of truth to the many friends that have earnestly formed psychic circles and gatherings throughout the entire world. Aid us, guide us on this most important question to mankind, spirit communication from across the grave. We ask this universal understanding in all humbleness, and we offer our grateful thanks to thee. Guide us, please. Amen. The spirit during seance can manifest itself in many ways. The most basic form is audible contact, communication based on a series of knocks or raps. A more accomplished trance medium may allow the spirit to enter their body for verbal communication or automatic writing. However, the rarest form of spirit materialization is when the medium excretes a substance known as ectoplasm. This repulsive mucus oozes from orifices on the medium's body. The spiritual entities are then said to drape this substance over their non-physical body, enabling partial or full torso materialization. During the late 19th century, scientists attempted to collect this elusive substance, but to no avail. Samples would mysteriously vanish from sealed containers or snap back into the medium before it could be collected. It was also reported that removing ectoplasm from a medium while in trance could have fatal consequences. Unknown to the mainstream scientific community, the spiritualist church in conjunction with scientists connected with the movement had made advances in the study of ectoplasm. Not only had samples been successfully taken, but research into the properties of this unearthly substance had opened doors to the spirit world that maybe should have remained closed. Sir William Crookes, a chemist and physicist and pioneer of the vacuum tube, was also a passionate spiritualist. He conducted many scientific investigations into the phenomena associated with seance and studied various mediums including Kate Fox, Florence Cook and Daniel Douglas Hume. Among the phenomena he witnessed were movements of bodies at a distance, wrappings, changings in the weight of bodies, levitation, appearance of luminous objects, appearance of phantom figures and circumstances which point to the agency of an outside intelligence. Crooks would necessitate a test environment for all mediums with specific criteria. It must be at my own house, with my own selection of friends and spectators, under my own conditions, and I may do whatever I like as regards to apparatus. The apparatus which Crooks mentions has been an area of debate for over a century, and little has been documented with regards to its purpose and design. Crooks' radiometer was one piece of apparatus that was seen regularly at his seance investigations and is still available today. This device consists of a glass bulb containing four paddles that rotate inside a vacuum. Originally designed as a device to test for psychokinetic ability, it was thought the electromagnetic field of spirits would also cause the paddles to rotate. In 1883, Daniel Douglas Hume documented in his diary, once Sir William had thoroughly scrutinised my abilities and completed his deliberations, those who had been invited as witness to the proceedings were kindly asked to leave. For the rest of the evening, Sir William and I drank brandy by the fire and shared our experiences associated with the spirit world. Had he not been under the influence of the fine brandy, I doubt he would have shown me the item of which I now write. I was shown to an attic room which resembled more a chemist's laboratory a room in which I can only have assumed Sir William conducted his experiments. My attention was drawn to a device. I immediately recognised the glass bulb apparatus that accompanied most research sessions, but the rest of the strange machine was like nothing I had ever seen before. Sir William then divulged to me the strangest of concepts. Hume was shown a device that according to Crookes could not only establish contact with the spirit world through mechanical means, but communicate with specific spirits. 
Previously, seances had proven to be a lottery in terms of who would come through. A grieving wife, for example, was not guaranteed communication with her deceased husband's spirit. The medium would sometimes be presented with a queue of lonely spirits, all wishing to convey a message regardless of the recipient. Crooks claimed his device, the residual ectometron, could channel a spirit directly using a material item once owned by the deceased. This could be jewellery, such as a ring or even a photograph. He regarded these as catalysts or keys, as they opened specific doors to predetermined entities in the spirit world. Hume also commented on the use of ectoplasm in tubes, which Crooks regarded as ectoplasmic batteries. Usually, a medium would sometimes need to produce ectoplasm in order for a spirit to manifest itself. However, these batteries retained the residual spirit energy from previous seances. It was this residual energy coupled with the electrostatic charge gathered by the familiar radiometer and the use of a catalyst or key that fueled this bizarre machine. This array of batteries was connected to a vacuum glass cylinder called the ectoplasmic chamber. This chamber was the spirit container, a means of retaining the spirit for as long as the operator wished. The spirit could then communicate by means of an external bell or by producing electrostatic lightning within the ectoplasmic chamber. In one experiment, Crookes used a brooch once owned by the Baroque composer Henry Purcell to contact his spirit. Crookes recalled conversing with the spirit of Purcell for over two hours. Previously, spirits could leave the seance at their own accord. However, Crookes had full control over the spirit and compared it to capturing bees in a jar. Hume was impressed, but became aware that the device could be dangerous in the wrong hands and warned Crooks. The machine allowed anyone to not only gain direct contact with the dead, but potentially contain the spirit in our dimension indefinitely. Hume was aware that a spirit captured like a bee in a jar would almost certainly be angry upon its release. It also allowed users with somewhat darker motives to contact some of the most unsavoury characters from history and imprison them as their spirit for some unholy endeavour. Crooks did not take kindly to Hume's criticism and as a result their friendship ended on bitter terms. It may be that Crooks did listen to Hume as no other evidence of Crooks' residual ectometron other than Hume's diary entry has ever been documented. It was also soon after this that Crooks was seen increasingly less in the spiritualist circuit. It was thought that the secret of the Crooks residual ectometron died with him in 1919. But then, in the early 1990s, a tantalising discovery came to light. On July the 17th, 1993, renovation works began on a Victorian property in Kensington, West London. The grand five-storey house was being converted into apartments and the building's interior was gutted. During the final stages of development, an attic room was discovered which contained more than just dust and dead pigeons. A locked chest was recovered which the property developers handed over to the Kensington and Chelsea Borough Council. Here it was opened and using archive records it was ascertained that the house had once been the home of Sir William Crooks and the chest must therefore have belonged to him. Members of Crook's family were traced, but all those contacted declined the offer of their great-grandfather's chest. After the mysterious contents had been merely described over the telephone, a family member even suggested burning it. As the chest was once owned by a pioneer scientist, the council finally donated it to the London Science Museum. Disappointingly for the museum, the contents did not reflect any of Crook's groundbreaking scientific works, such as the cathode ray or spectral analysis so the chest was auctioned to fund the Museum Trust. As a keen scholar of the spiritualist movement, I was naturally interested when I read of an auction for a chest containing the personal effects of Sir William Crooks. The Times article covered the mysterious find in the Kensington attic room and how the Council and Science Museum could not find any use for the items the chest contained. Yet at no point did the article discuss the contents even at the auction, the listing was simply described as Lot 155, a chest containing assorted personal effects allegedly owned by the late Sir William Crooks. For a princely sum I do not wish to discuss through fear my wife may find out, the chest was now my property. In hindsight, the price was more than fair as a chest contained what might be classed as the holy grail of spiritualist paraphernalia. 
It was previously assumed that Hume's diary entry may have just been the result of too much brandy, and Crook's tale may have been just to scare Hume and baffle him with science. On opening the chest, it was apparent that Crooks had collected all of his spiritualist research papers, apparatus and books and locked them away. The fact that they had been placed in a remote attic room at his home suggested he did not have the heart to destroy the collection, but on the other hand, he did not want easy access to it. It was now also clear why the chest had been dismissed by the Science Museum, as spiritualism had no direct link with mainstream science, regardless of the importance of its owner to the scientific world. As I look back over the circumstances that led me to the chest, I feel that some external force is partially responsible for the rediscovery of Crook's residual ectometron. Not only was I now privy to undisclosed knowledge, but I was able to witness firsthand the uncanny power of Crook's strange machine and why he chose to hide it. Using Crookes radiometer, thermal radiation is gathered and converted into electrostatic energy, designed to replicate the typical levels of electrostatic energy a human body would possess. This energy, combined with the ectoplasmic gas released by the batteries, gives the spirit a physical medium in which to communicate through. This synthetic medium supports the spirit in material form for as long as the user wishes, depending on the amount of ectoplasm used. By inserting an ectoplasmic battery into the spirit support unit, the ectoplasm contained within the glass tubes is transformed into a gas. It is this ectoplasmic gas that the spirit will use to materialize inside the ectoplasmic chamber. The engine will gradually gather speed as more gas is produced, and in turn, it will transfer electrostatic energy from the collector to charge the cloud and allow the spirit to take physical form. In order for a spirit to materialize, a minimum amount of charged ectoplasmic gas is required. This is stored in the ectoplasmic gas reservoir. This gas cylinder contains the spirit once a successful materialization has taken place. The white ectoplasmic cloud charged with electrostatic energy is released into the chamber as soon as the spirit wishes to commune. The spirit is unaware that it will be retained indefinitely, whereas previous, in a materialization through a human medium, the spirit could choose to leave at will. The ectoplasmic chamber has been engineered to safely contain a spirit, something that has never been achieved. In theory, spirits, such as troublesome entities, can be contacted, caught and retained within the chamber therefore allowing the user to remove the spirit from the place of haunting. The downside is that in order to incarcerate a spirit indefinitely, a continuous supply of ectoplasm would be required. A standard battery will maintain a spirit trapped in ectoplasmic form for approximately 45 minutes. While the ectoplasmic cloud is sufficiently charged with electrostatic energy, the spirit will be unable to leave of its own accord resulting in a physical prison. While incarcerated in the ectoplasmic chamber, the spirit may communicate through the external bell communicator using the standard protocol. One ring for yes, two rings for no. In order to successfully release a spirit, it must be noted that the radiometer must not be operating, nor should the spirit support engine be moving. Once all machinery has ceased, the lid of the chamber may be opened carefully. The ectoplasmic gas will sit in the chamber until the spirit leaves. Without the aid of electrostatic energy, the spirit and ectoplasmic gas will dissipate into the atmosphere without danger of the spirit returning to take revenge on its temporary captor. It has been noted that the exit of a spirit usually takes the form of a small vortex.